think we're good. Can everybody hear me? Am I coming out? I hope so. If something changes, then I'll I gotta back up. <laughs> Don't know how to get out of that. And my kids let me know this morning. You know, Dad, if the speakers fall, they're gonna kill you. Now, it's just something I had noticed, and now that I do notice it, it's awesome. I'm glad they can point out the stuff that really matters. It makes you feel good about living. That's why you have kids, so that they can build you up. Like this. Especially when you know you're maybe a little nervous for each other. Don't worry, Dad. If the thing falls on a kid, you don't have to be nervous anymore. So, with that, my, we'll start off with this. The, the phrase we often say, man, I am so busy. Some of us are really, really busy. Some of us like to seem busy. We like to say that with a sigh because we want everybody to think we're busy, whether or not we are busy. And sometimes we're busy, but we're really not doing anything. There's a lot of ways of being busy. Busy, being busy can be a badge of honor in our society. It can be a way to convince ourselves that we're a significant person. Man, I'm busy. Man, I've got work to do. Man, I'm doing stuff. But I found myself in life. You can be doing busy work, but at the end of the day, it doesn't really get you from A to B. It just kind of keeps you occupied while things are going on. We like to think, man, I'm always busy, so I'm important. And it can also present a problem. Because busyness doesn't always equal productivity. There can be sandcastles. You can spend all day working on a sandcastle. It can be the most magnificent sandcastle that's ever been built, only to be destroyed within two seconds of a way. It's the same thing. We spend all our lives trying to build something here on Earth or have earthly things because life happens. Tornadoes happen. Hurricanes happen. We see these things happen where what we have is gone in a minute and we have to wonder well, what are, what's life all about. I spent my whole life building this and now it's gone. I see people who spend a whole life building a business and it's a wonderful business, a productive business, only to find that they've got to retire and what I do in my business, I don't, I'm going to sell it. Family doesn't want it and we spent all this time working on it so we've got to find our purpose for living and that's the question this morning. What is our purpose for living? Why should we get up every day? What should make us want to get up every day and to do things that benefit other people and to have a good, a good time and a good life? Do I have purpose behind the decisions I make? Now this is very important. I will never find my ultimate purpose in what I do. It's just a fact. I will never find my ultimate purpose in what I do. I think I've said it before, but I say it all the time. I heard it, Matt Papa talk about it first, but everything on this earth is going to let us down. Everything. There is nothing that is not going to let us down because either we're going to die or it's going to die or it's going to be destroyed. Then what? There's got to be more to life than just stuff, things that we accumulate, things that we do. We've got to have a reason why we get up and go and do the things we do. See, on our personal journey to discover meaning, tell you what, it all begins and ends with our relationship with Jesus because that's where we're going to find purpose. Not in what we do, but who we know and the fact of knowing our Savior. Deep, meaningful, satisfying life can only come from connecting to Jesus. And once this is done, He will give us our purpose for living. He will give us meaning behind what we'll do. We'll find out what we're supposed to do with the things that we have and where we're supposed to go and who we're supposed to meet. You know, on the surface, a lot of people look like Christians. But we've got to ask ourselves, when we're alone, what do we look like? Stats don't lie. And it's not that it makes us more evil than anybody else, but Christians do have problems. Christians have problems with pornography. The stats are out there. Christians have problems with alcoholism. Christians have problems with relationships. Well, we're not any different. The same sin that affects a non-believer affects a Christian, and we all still have those battles. But one thing we've got to be careful of, especially when we bring it into the church, is what is our purpose behind everything we do? Every decision that we make on a Sunday morning, what are we trying to get at? If our purpose is to cause strife and division, we're headed down a bad road. If our purpose is to cause just for us to get our way, we're headed down a bad road. We need to make sure that every decision we make is Christ-centered, that it's done through prayer, that we make a prayerful 
time to that. When we spend time in prayer, we focus on prayer, we get groups of people to pray, we're about to do this, God, is this what you want us to do? So many times we start things out and then we say, God, bless what we're doing when we should be saying, God, what do you want us to do so that God will bless what we're doing? Not, I'm going to do it. God bless me. God bless what I'm starting to do. I get to thinking about you know, we talk a lot, I talk a lot, I get to deal with teenagers a lot, and we talk about consequences. There are multiple consequences for what we do. That's why it's so important to have Jesus behind every decision we make so that that purpose is a God-centered purpose, and we're going to bear fruit from that decision, because consequences are going to happen always. Hopefully they are good consequences, but they're not always good consequences. Sometimes they're always bad consequences. I talk about this. If you are laying up in a hospital bed, you have no teeth, you're having trouble breathing, your face looks like a catcher's mitt, and you've done meth for the past 10 years, it's not really going to be God's fault, now is it? It's decisions that you have made where you have chosen to go down a bad road, a road that God did not bless, and we're going to have to face the consequences. In the same way, when we do things that are pleasing to God, there could be good consequences. And Jesus talked about this by talking about a vineyard. We'll be in John chapter 15 this morning. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. John chapter 15, beginning in verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it, so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Only hours before his arrest and crucifixion, Jesus makes his seventh I am statement by calling himself the true vine. He was the good shepherd. He is the door. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Here are all these things in John, and specifically John is, is, is organized around these seven I am statements. And by calling himself the true vine, Jesus is saying, I'm the source of all life that is going to flow through anyone on planet Earth. I'm the source. And since he's the source of life for every branch, for you and I, it is critical that we're attached to the vine. What happens when we, you see a, a, it could even be a, a bad vine, a vine you're trying to get rid of, a weed that's grown up in your flower bed, or a weed that's grown up in your yard. You pull it up, pull it away from the source. The next day, what's it look like? It's dry, it's withered, and it's dying. Poor dead. Sometimes we have to think about our own life. Is our life dry? I mean, do we not have a lot of happiness? Do we not have a lot of joy? Are we just, just dry? We just don't feel like things are going like they ought to go. Do we feel like we're withering up? Like we're just not able to get going like we used to? Well, my question is, are you connected to the vine? Are you connected to the source of the power that Christians are supposed to be connected to? It's critical and vital that the branches are connected to Jesus. And sin breaks this connection. Sin breaks this connection. And we're all going to sin. That's a fact of life. We can't get away from that. But when we are practicing sin, or I like to say, don't plan on sinning. I also tell girls, including my daughter, don't date a project. Don't expect them to change. Okay? Don't, don't expect that to happen. But if you feel this way, where's your connection? Why do I stay connected? Well, do you read your Bible daily? I mean, read it, study it, ask questions. One of the things I find out that I'm very guilty of is when I pray is, God, give me this. God, give me this. God, I need this. Lord, help me here. Lord, help me here. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray. I'll listen. I'm going to listen to anybody. And that's part of the conversation. It's part of a relationship. It's two-way. It's talking and listening. We've got to listen to what he's talking about, what he wants us to do. First point I want to make this morning is that we'll find purpose in life when we bear fruit. Jesus announced the vineyard keeper who was God in this story removes every branch that doesn't produce fruit, meaning the branch must produce fruit associated with the vine. That is proof of the connection. We know an apple tree because it has apples. We know an orange tree because it 
it has orange. We know a lemon tree because it has lemons. We're supposed to know that you are a believer, that I'm a believer, because we have Christ flowing through us. People can look at us and say, man, that person is different. That person is, must be really walking somewhere special. What is different about you? Which opens up the door to be able to tell people about the hope that is inside of you. The problem is we have too many suckers in the church today. Now let me finish this. When I say suckers, i got to complete this. Because I used to try to grow tomatoes. Because I love tomatoes. And if you grow tomatoes, you know there are branches that pop up on that tomato vine that are completely worthless. They're called suckers, because that's what I've always been told they're called, and that's what I call them. They add nothing. They bear no fruit, and they're a drain on the planet. What do you do to a sucker? You reach down, and you tear it off. It's good for nothing. It's a drain on everyone and everybody. And it's a drain, in this case, on the planet. Ask, think about this this morning. Before you enter the sanctuary, before you even came, this, I hope this is going, going on. But have you prayed for this morning's service? Have you spent time praying that God would move in a special way in this morning's service? Let me ask you this. Have you spent time praying that God will bring people Twin Lakes Baptist Church that are living out here within a mile, then two miles, that aren't going anywhere. Have we been praying? God, bring these people to peace. God, show me who they are so I can go and talk to them and invite them here. Have we done these kind of things? Are we producing fruit or are we just kind of hanging out on the vine? These are important things. Pray for your church leaders. Pray, in this case, for the right man to fill this spot where I'm standing, for a pastor. Are you praying for these things, expecting God to do these things? And then once you walk into church, and I'll get in trouble a lot of times when I say this, are you prepared to participate or spectate? See, if you go to a ball game, there's two types of people. There are spectators that are watching things go by, and there are people who are participating. The athletes, the officials, the band, the student, whatever. They're actually engaged in what's going on. And I pray that this place becomes a place where we're all actively engaged in everything that goes on, whether from the listening to a uh, Preacher, talk, preach words, but more than that, when it's the worship time, lifting our voices and singing and really focusing on God. This, uh, for a lot of us, this is the only time all week that we take the time to just focus directly on God and ask Him, how can I be a better person? How can I be a happier person? People who claim to be Christians but are not are unmasked because of the fruit they bear. It doesn't take long to be around someone who never bears fruit, who never bears Christian fruit. You have to begin to wonder what's going on in their life. And we're going to talk about it. It doesn't mean they're lost necessarily, but in a lot of cases it does. I mean, immediately when the church began, Paul warned, look out for false people in the church who are claiming to be believers but aren't. Be careful. They're coming. And Paul wrote that in, in Acts. You know, the, I see all these signs. We're in Acts chapter 2 church. Congratulations. By the time they got to Acts chapter 3, they were having trouble. So uh, be focused on God. That's what matters. And a lot of times God is going to, well, not all, a lot of, he's going to remove the counterfeit faith. He's going to remove it. Why does he do that? Well, sometimes it's, Serious business, somebody is, is corrupting and, and hurting the Christian fellowship so bad God physically removes them out. Sometimes he just takes us out of the game. Sometimes he just takes us out of the game. We're not involved. He, he benches us. It's not that we're lost. It's just we're not doing what we're supposed to do. And we're benched for a little while until we get things going right. <coughs> walking or not walking with Jesus has eternal consequences. If you're out there doing your own thing, you're you are headed for a good whacking because Jesus talks about pruning this vine. Are you doing anything that benefits God's kingdom? Are you bearing any fruit? We 
say, I mean, I'm not sure what that looks like. Let's talk about what that looks like for a minute. Some people are evangelists. They bear fruit by going out and sharing the gospel and winning people to the law. Now, we'll tell you this. There is a gift of evangelism. There are people who are specially gifted with being able to come up here and preach a message and of evangelism and see people come to the Lord. There are people that are gifted to go out in their neighborhood and do that. Not everybody is, has a special gift to do that, but we're all commanded to evangelize. It's not a suggestion, and it's not a, a spiritual gift on its own. There are some who are gifted that are better than others, but we're all to share the love of Christ to anyone we meet. That's a commandment. But sharing the gospel, John chapter 4, Already he who reads is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. Here's that deal. You never know when the person you're talking to, let's say they're lost. Let's say it's someone in your family that's been lost for years. You know it and you've been praying and for You never know when you're going to, when God is going to, the life's going to go. And that's the point here. Some people sow the seed. Some people consistently are telling people, you need to come to Jesus. You need to come to Jesus. This is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. And you speak to somebody. You talk to them and they, you think they ignore you. And you think they just blow you off and they go away. And you talk to them again and nothing changes. And you talk to them again and nothing changes. And then eight months down the road, they're at the weirdest place and they convert Jesus says some people will sow, others will gain the benefit of the reader. We're all doing this together. Just because you preach or you talk to somebody and they're rejecting you, they're not rejecting you, they're not rejecting me, they're rejecting the gospel, but if we keep doing it, eventually, eventually God will tear down those walls. Think about this. If there were a pack of dogs out there and I threw a rock, who's gonna, which one's going to yell? When I hit it. When I hit, most of the time, the person who really complains the most about it, oh, stop giving me your Christian faith. We're talking about that Christian. I don't want, it's the one that is, God is dealing with the most. And they're the closest to making decisions. That's why they're battling amongst themselves. They're having an inside struggle. Don't give up. Don't give up on anybody. But that is a spiritual gift. There are other spiritual gifts. There are acts of service, meaning the ministry you do in the name of Jesus. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. I'm just going to... Maybe if you want to cut that one off, I don't know. I hear that going on. Can you still hear me? Yeah. I'll keep going. Um... A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. And finally, some people insist fruit is about personal growth, the character of Jesus that he, that he shapes in us. Maturing in Christ, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things there is no law. I would like to encourage you all to remember that's not the fruits of the Spirit. It's not the fruits. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's singular. As a believer, we should have all these characteristics. We should show love. We should show joy. We should show peace. We should be patient with one another. We should demonstrate kindness to one another. We should have a, an air of goodness about us, being faithful, gentle, self-controlled. <coughs> I just can't change the way I am. I'm just, just, just the way I am. That's just the way God made me. Full. We all have a sin problem, but if, through Jesus Christ, even the worst anger person can become gentle. It's called giving up what I want and going after what God wants. It's called dying to self. I got tickled when I was going over this this week. But, you know, should I say this? The church should look like a bunch of fruit. I knew that wasn't going to come out right. <laughs> what I'm getting at, it should be a fruit garden. I thought that would be better. There should be 
when people walk in here, they should see like apples, oranges, bananas, grapes, because not everybody has the same gift, but everybody has some gift, and everybody ought to be finding out what that gift is, and everybody ought to be bearing some form of fruit. This church should look like one big fruit garden of Christianity. But be prepared. God doesn't just want you to exist. He wants you to bear and produce fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. The choir sang Refiner's Fire this morning. I don't know if that was the title, but that's what I was listening and getting out of that. It's the same thing here. Every, we're going to be pruned by God. If you're a believer, you're going to be pruned. What is pruning? It's cutting things away, cutting things back so that more will grow. That's not going to be fun. A lot of times we go through a dry season in our life, and when we do, you got to ask yourself, am I connected to the vine? If I am, what does God want out of my life? What, what's going on? If we find out we're not connected at all, then we've got to address that first. But understand when the pruning comes, and all believers go through this. God is unrelenting in shaping us like Jesus. He does not want to give up on us. It's called sanctification is that big word. We start off as a believer one day. I feel like your Christian growth should be that by the time you die and we step into, this, into heaven, it's not like a huge change. Because we have been growing and walking with Christ for so long, we are starting to see heaven on earth. It's because he's been pruning us all these years to make us more like him. So ask yourself, am I becoming more like Jesus every day? The goal is progress. The goal is never perfection. Continuing in verse 4, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. And it will be done for you. It's a lot, isn't it? A lot of this stuff's taken out of context from time to time. Let's talk about it. Jesus, Jesus repeatedly uses the word abide, 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 abide. Ten times in John 15, 4 through 10, Jesus uses the word abide. He wants to emphasize this interweaving that goes on in the life of a believer to where Jesus is living inside of us so much that he comes out of us. To abide in this context carries the idea of personal intimate relationship. Jesus has taken up residence in your body, in your house, in your temple. And if Jesus is in there, he promises to produce a spring that just blows up. Now I think about when the children of Israel were stuck in the wilderness and they had no water. I used to think, my goodness, that was a pretty cool trick. We think God and Moses hit the rock and water flowed. And I think of a little water fountain sheet water. That's cool and all, but how are you going to give a million people water with a water fountain sheet and water? Up? Didn't happen. When Bakr knew, when, uh, made his way into Saudi Arabia to uh, Jabal al Laws, the Mount of Moses, the Arabs have called the Mount of Moses for centuries and people have ignored. They found there the split rock of Horeb. It's a rock that's like 10 stories high and from Bottom, from the bottom to the top, it is cracked. And it shows immense amounts of erosion. This thing exploded and water went everywhere. There's evidence of a lake at the foot of Jabal al Laws in Saudi Arabia. A lake. That's what's supposed to come out. I sound like good, whatever that is. Uh, and Star Wars, Jaja Jaw Binks. That's what's supposed to come out. Sorry, I got carried away. But that's what's supposed to happen. We're supposed to blow up and we're supposed to, they're supposed to see Jesus all over us. Hmm. 
garter plants, waters, fertilizers, keeps the weeds away. Jesus does that. Plants us, fertilizes us, waters us, gives us what we need. We're supposed to grow. We're supposed to stay connected. And we're supposed to bear fruit. That's what we're supposed to do. When this process is clicking, it's a beautiful thing. Even during the pruning process, we're growing consistently and bearing fruit. And we're changing not only our life, but changing the lives of people around us by the way we have. But understand, Jesus included a very stern warning. If you don't abide in me, meaning you're cut off from the vine. In this case, I believe we're talking about people who have rejected Christ as their Lord and Savior. They've rejected Jesus. and don't want anything to do with him. He is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Hell is a real place. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven when he was on earth. A lot of people don't realize that. I had a professor, Dr. Danny Nance, said it one time, I think he said it best, that every time Jesus spoke in hell, he probably had a tear in his eye. It wasn't like, you're going to hell, and let's have a good sermon on you're going to hell. It's like, these people really are going to hell. It's a separation from God from eternity, and they don't need to go there. We need to be doing everything we can to keep them out of there by sharing the good news. What would you do to keep your grandchild out of hell? What would you do? What if you have a grandchild or a child or a friend that won't come to church? What are you willing to change here to get them in here to hear the gospel message and spend eternity with Jesus? Jesus promised if you abide in me and my words abide in you, things are going to be amazing. Things are going to be amazing. Which brings us to this one. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. I've heard that all my life. There's a lot of denominations that sprung up over that. All you got to do is ask in Jesus' name, you'll get what you want. Jesus is a big vending machine in the sky. Just ask him, pull the lever, he's going to drop down what you want. And that's how people treat Jesus, and that's heretical. That's terrible. He's God. He's not a vending machine in the sky. They like to leave out portions of scripture to get to that. Yeah, that's the fun part. Anything you ask in my name, I will give you. But he's talking to the person who is connected and abiding in the vine. If you're not abiding in the vine, if you're not producing fruit, he's not talking to you. Because if I'm connected to Jesus and I'm walking with him daily, I'm not going to ask for something that he's not ready to give me. So therefore, I can ask for anything because I'm not going to ask for something that he doesn't want me to have because I'm walking with him. That verse is applicable to all of us who walk with him daily. We also have to remember that sometimes when we ask Jesus something, the answer is no. It doesn't mean he's not going to, that he hadn't answered it. It's just no. You're not ready for that. You're not ready in the pruning process. If I give you that, you're going to, you're not ready for that responsibility. And you're, you're going to blow up. So remain in Christ. When we remain in him, we're saturated with him. Our heart beats with his compassion. And we bow to his lordship. And this changes our prayer. Do I need to take this new job, Lord? Do I need to take it? How do I get through to my child? God, I'm at a crossroads and need to make a decision. I don't know which way to go. Do I need, do I, do I need to change my attitude? We find ourselves not getting along with people all the time. It might be you. Me. We don't want to say that, but it could be. We have to ask ourselves, do I need to change? Do I need to make changes in my life, in my church? Abide in the vine, and God will help you through that. Abide in the vine. Stay connected to Jesus. Walk daily with him. Rather than play, praying a laundry list of demands, the believer begins praying, not my will, but yours. Lord, what do you want me to do? 
We become secondary, and then God starts pouring out the blessings of heaven when we put those second and put him first. Lord, what do you want me to do? What do I need to do? And he changes so many things in our life. Walk with him. And the believer who remains in Jesus will pray like Jesus prayed. You know, our lives are in the balance in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, if there's any other way for mankind to be saved other than me having to go through this hell I'm about to go through, please let me know now. I want out of it. The answer was, son, there's not another way, not my will, but yours. Father, is there any way I can get out of this, this torture? No, son, this is what's got to be. Not my will, but yours. And he got up and resolutely went to the cross. That's what we're supposed to do, Lord. We can pray boldly when we're walking with Jesus. We can meditate on the Word of God. And we can bring glory to God. That's our purpose for living, is to bring glory to God. Is to make Jesus famous in our Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and uttermost parts of the world. Make him famous. Give him the accolades. Put him on prominent dis display. And we can do this in two ways. First, we glorify God. We produce a lot of fruit. When you lead people to the faith or you're doing good things in the community, you're helping the poor, you're feeding the poor, you're helping the down and out. These are all ways you can show people the love of Jesus. When you overcome a personal weakness or when you get rid of a habit, you're showing people that you are uh, and what Jesus can do. And when you humbly acknowledge your inability to generate any of these things on your own and point to God, he gets the glory and we've done our jobs. The second way we glorify God is when we, as he says, you prove that you're my disciple. What does that mean? Well, nobody can generate true life change on their own. Changes will always point to someone beyond you, and I hope that is God. Purpose is found when we step off the ugly treadmill of duty, bow into religious busyness, and get on the slow but sure track toward bearing fruit for Christ. Just commit yourself to Christ and then go after the day-to-day -day stuff and start going to work. Commit yourself to Christ, go to work. Begin the morning with Christ, go to work. Begin the, the end the day with Christ, sleep, get up, begin the day with Christ, and go to work. It's hard for me. I feel like I'm not wired that way, but I try. But Jesus, was every early in the morning, Jesus was on his own alone in prayer before anybody else got moved. If it was that important for Jesus, for Jesus, the King of kings and Lord of lords, to start his day in prayer, it's probably a good idea that we do that as well. A life in Christ is productive. It's a life with purpose. So this week, as we wrap this up and begin, what steps do you need to take to make sure you remain in the mind? Well, do an a evaluation of your life and look for things in your life that are not Christ-like. That you can look at and say, man, these things need to go. I, this is not benefiting me or Christianity or anybody else, and we need to get rid of it and replace them with acts of service to God. Even on your busiest day this week, remember that Jesus alone is your source and your purpose for life. Choose to remain in Him and allow His power to produce fruit for His glory. So, what is all this meant today? It really doesn't mean anything but this connect with Jesus. Connect with him daily. Stay connected with him. And see how that changes your life. If you're struggling, before you give up, begin looking toward Jesus. Begin your day with him. Give these issues over to him and see how he changes you before you give up. Jesus alone gives us a reason for living. Now the deeds or the fruit of the flesh are evident. This is the stuff that people that aren't clicked into the vine do. Immorality, impurity, sensuality. I want you to think about this. We see this in the world. Immorality, impurity. 
sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger. These are fruit of people who are lost. This should not be fruit of people who are in the church. Disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice these things will not make it to heaven. Period. However, but the fruit of the Spirit, when we walk with Christ, this is what we can experience. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Where are you connected? Who are you connected to? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your love. I thank you for the promises that we have for a better life. Not always a happy life, but a joyful life, a better life, more connected to you so important that we find connection with you and it's so important that we connect others to you because without that connection we are just so lost and so dry and so miserable looking around at this world and I can read the headlines from diseases warfare People being treated unfairly. That's not supposed to be us. We're supposed to feel your kingdom power. Your gentleness. Your humbleness. Your meekness. Your power. And just your name. Just your name brought to death, hearing the blind sight, the lame walk. We need to expect miracles. It shouldn't be on a tire shop sign. It should be on the church sign. Expect miracles because we're all tied into you. Because we're tied into you, you flow from us. And when you flow out of us, you're going to change people's lives. Let that be us this morning, Father. People that are changed. People that are following you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.